We have a reading from Daniel and chapter 4 in the Old Testament. We'll be reading from verse 1 through to verse 16, and then missing a few verses to join in at verse 22. Daniel chapter 4, beginning at the first verse. Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I thought it good to declare the signs and wonders that the Most High God has worked for me. How great are his signs and how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream which made me afraid and the thoughts on my uh, my bed and the visions of my head troubled me. Therefore, I issued a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers came in, and I told them the dream, but they did not make known to me its interpretation. But at last Daniel came before me. His name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God. In him is the spirit of the holy God. And I told the dream before him, saying, Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy God is in you and no secret troubles you, explain to me the visions of my dream that I have seen and its interpretation. These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it. The birds of the heavens dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. He cried aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and cut off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from its branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man Let him be given the heart of a beast, and let seven times pass over him. Then if we move to verse 22, as Daniel is interpreting for Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel says, It is you, O king, who have grown and become strong. For your greatness has grown and reaches to the heavens, and your dominion to the end of the earth. And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump, it, leave it, its stump and roots in the earth, bound with, a, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of heaven and let him graze with the beasts of the field till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king. And this is the, de- the decree of the Most High which has come upon my lord, the king. They shall drive you from men. Your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomever he chooses. And inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you, after you come to know that heaven rules. Therefore, O king, let my advice be acceptable to you. Break off your sins by being righteous and your iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. Perhaps there may be a lengthening of your prosperity. All this came upon King Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he was walking about the royal palace of Babylon. The king spoke, saying, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my mighty power and for the honour of my majesty? 
While the word was still in the king's mouth, a voice fell from heaven. King Nebuchadnezzar, to you it is spoken. The kingdom has departed from you. And they shall drive you from men, and your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make you eat grass like oxen, and seven times shall pass over you, until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomever he chooses. That very hour, the word was fulfilled concerning Nebuchadnezzar. He was driven from men, and ate grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hair had grown like eagle's feathers, and his nails like bird's claws. And at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my understanding returned to me, and I blessed the Most High and praised and honoured him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. No one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? So this morning we looked at Psalm 1, Psalm 1, and this evening we're looking at Psalm 2. Now, some people have remarked, and I think there's something to it, that these two psalms together represent the entire Psalter. So if you want, you can tell your friends later this week that on Sunday we had a series on the whole Psalter. Uh, because Psalm 1 and 2, when you put them together, uh, they sum up the, the message of the whole book. Now, Psalm 2. This is, um, this is one of David's psalms. It might not be in the little heading that you have there, but we know it's one of David's because Christians praying to God in Acts chapter 4 said that this was David's psalm, and we can take their word for it quite safely. But we're also going to say this evening that not only is Psalm 2 written by David, but it's about our Lord Jesus Christ. How do we know that Psalm 2 is about Jesus? How can I say that with such confidence? How can you take my word for it? Well, in the New Testament, there are seven references to Psalm 2. How many of those seven do you think refer to our Lord Jesus? Seven. Every single time that the New Testament references Psalm 2, it's in connection with Jesus. And so that's, the, uh, that's how we're going to look at it this evening. So let's read it together, Psalm 2, from verse 1. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bonds in pieces and cast their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So we're going to look at this in, uh, as is the tradition, three points. First we'll look at the enemies of our Lord Jesus in verses 1 to 3. Then we'll see the response of his father to his enemies from verse 4 onwards. And then we'll see the inevitable end of all of this. At the end of the psalm. So first of all, the enemies of our Lord Jesus, verses 1 to 3. Who is it that the enemies, uh, who are the enemies of God and Jesus here? Who are the enemies in Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3? 
Well, Christians in Acts 4, we mentioned them a moment ago, they apply it to the Sanhedrin. When they're praying there in Acts 4, they're praying about these enemies of God and his anointed, and they say it's the Sanhedrin, uh, these people who had Jesus put to death, these people who obstructed the preaching of the gospel, threw the saints into prison, they said it's them. David says it's the whole world. The nations are raging. They are at enmity with God and his king. We may read into Psalm 2 our own governments, insofar as they oppose the kingship of Jesus, that is. Because we know that world governments, they pit themselves against the kingship of Jesus, don't they, sometimes? For example, Jesus says adultery is wrong and it ruins families. But our governments might say, no, it's not. Never mind family, you can sleep with whoever you like. King Jesus says murder is wrong. And our government says, well, that depends. If you're young enough, we can abort you. If you're old enough, we can euthanize you. Jesus bans usury, but governments allow it. Jesus requires worship of the one true living God in spirit and in truth. But many governments over the world criminalize it, even establishing into their laws worship of false gods. Jesus comes to free captives, and we have governments in the world that make captives. Now, before you think I'm a revolutionary, um, we must be thankful for our governments. This is why I asked... um, David, to uh, pray for our government, in particular this evening. It's important that we do. We're commanded to do so by God. Our governments are a God-given gift to us for us to pray for, for us to bless. They are our provision. They are our protection. They give us law and order, which is no small blessing indeed. Despite their godless faults, they are there for our good. And besides, David has a bigger agenda here than just the world government's. See, who else is involved here? Look at verses 1 through 3. Who else are the enemies of God and his Christ? It's not just the nations. In verse 1, it's why do the nations rage and the people plot? See, all the people of all of the nations are dragged into this condemnation. Every individual. Of course, this especially applies to the unbeliever in a sense but undoubtedly it lumps us all in we are all in this together opposing the kingship of Jesus in Psalm 2 verse 1 believers can resist the kingship of Christ too we all want to be kings and queens over our own lives don't we we want to be sovereign over our own little world without God as a rival Do you have any children? Remember them when they were about this high. And when you would uh, bring them a a new toy, it's their birthday, it's Christmas, or it was on sale or whatever, you bring them a new toy and you you give it to them and they take it and there's no thanks. They're just happy to have it. Uh, They might smile, but they're just really glad to have this. But apart from that, no thanks. Might not even get a reaction and... But if you take that away, then you'll have a reaction. If you take that away, they bawl, they scream, they might get angry. Do you remember that? That attitude is present in so many people today. It's present in many of us even here. Giving God no thought for all of his blessing. Every dinner he puts on our table. Every day he clothes us. Every day we wake up and the roof hasn't caved in. Every day we wake up and our houses aren't flooded. We wake up and our spouses are still beside us. We wake up, our children are still here. And all of these blessings, all of them, they're all by God. They're all from God to us, freely, kindly, by his grace. And do we thank him? Do we thank him enough? We can't thank him enough for these blessings that we have. But woe betide him if he withholds anything from us. 
We blame him and we curse him if he takes anything from us. Yes, it's down to each and every one of us that we want to be the king of me land, don't we? Deciding what is right and wrong for ourselves. And we decide how we ought to behave and how others ought to behave. And you better toe the line with me in my little world. And we insist that others behave according to the rules of our little land. We, it, this is our kingship over our lives, not a thought for the kingship of Jesus. For example, Jesus says in Matthew 6 and verse 31 onwards, Do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, what shall we wear? Your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things, but seek first the kingdom of God, and all his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. How many of us say in reply to that? But what do I wear? But what am I going to eat? What about my job? What about my pension, my house? Never mind the kingdom of God. What about my hair? What about my clothes? What about where I'm going to get my next job? Or where my next paycheck is going to come from? Never mind not worrying. Jesus says, come unto me. And I will give you rest. And the world, it will go anywhere, anywhere at all but Jesus for rest. How many of our friends are stuck in horoscopes, stuck on Facebook, stuck on Instagram? You've got to get that profile picture right. They go to yoga, they go to therapy, they go to the gym, they go to church, they go to Christian conferences. Anywhere but Jesus for rest, for a quiet conscience. You know, our Lord Jesus, he offered himself on the cross to God our Father so that he could offer himself to be our king. He offers himself to be your king, even this evening. And not just any king, a loving king. A king who will provide for you everything that you will ever need. Out of his free grace and kindness. He promises to protect you from all evil. He says if you take me as your king. If you make yourself my subject in my kingdom. I will prepare for you mansions in glory. Which you can't imagine how wonderful they are. Oh but for how long did we say no. Let's cast his bonds from us. I want to be king of my life. I want to live and to speak and to do as I ask. Even Christians think and speak like that sometimes. Imagine a, a city. Imagine a city in your mind. It's been besieged by an army from a foreign nation. This army has broken into the city and has taken over. The war is won. And this city is lost. That new army draws a border around the city and includes it in its land. The city now belongs to someone else. And the king moves in. The king builds a new palace in this city that he has conquered. And he sits there and he establishes a new legal system. A new social system. There's even a new post office and a new train station. And it's all now new. Completely subdued by this new king. But there are pockets of this city that still house some rebellion. There are still people involved in a resistance movement against the new king. And unfortunately that is the Christian heart. Until we come to glory, until Jesus comes again, we are warring in ourselves. We have been overcome. We have been subdued. Christians have been completely defeated by the love of Jesus do you remember that day when you were just overwhelmed, overcome, completely run over by this new king? He's moved into my heart. I love him and I serve him. But we say with Newton, my heart is like a city but half subdued. 
mutinies and insurrections are daily happening. It's so sad and it's so hard and it's so frustrating, isn't it, when we catch ourselves thinking, speaking like that. Now, I must be sensitive here. Allow me to suggest that church is one of those places where we need to be most careful. On the lookout for those pockets of rebellion and resistance in our hearts. Church is where this can persist most clearly. We might slip into the habit of thinking, this is my house. This is my little kingdom. This little bit over here, this rota there, this club over here, these are my things. And I decide what happens to them. And so and so and so and so better pull their weight. They better do it my way because I'm the little king of this little part of the church. It has to be said Watch out for this in your heart. Don't think about other people's hearts. Watch out for it in your heart. Because it is so rotten. Because this place is God's. We are God's workmanship. We are God's people that make up God's church. We serve the church. The church is now ours. Watch out for that in your heart. I'll watch out for it in mine. Let's see the Lord's uh, response to this. Let's see the Father's response to this, this, uh, the enemies of Jesus coming against his kingship in verses 4 through 6. Verses 4 through 6. Imagine in your mind a grandmother who plays Scrabble. She plays it every day, in fact, but she goes to club once a week. And she's very good. She has it on her phone as well. And she, uh, she's, she's very, very good at it. She's one of the best in the county. And her granddaughter, who visits her every other day, uh, sees that she likes Scrabble a lot. And uh, her granddaughter wants to learn how to play. So her, the grandmother, she teaches her granddaughter how to play Scrabble. She teaches her. She has five or six games with her. And her granddaughter, now she's catching on, this little girl. She starts to think, I'm getting good at this. I can spell some words. I'm getting some points on the board. This is quite good. So after six or seven games... She, uh, she then, this little girl, she rocks up at her grandmother's Scrabble club that week and challenges her grandmother at a game of Scrabble to see if she can beat her. And it was only after a few turns that it was very clear that 60 years of playing Scrabble doesn't match up to six games. And with a triple word tile featuring gherkins, the game was over. The grandmother had won. That little smirk that you have on your face, or some of you anyway, that laugh, that's written into verse 4 here. The combined efforts of the whole world against God, the combined efforts of all of his enemies, all the peoples of all the nations in all the world against the King Jesus, the Father laughs. He laughs at it. It's laughable that we should think ourselves independent of God. Remember that reading we had in Daniel 4, that lesson that God was trying to teach Nebuchadnezzar, until you know that the Most High rules in heaven, and he gives it to whomever he chooses, and he's chosen Jesus, not you. Despite the futile, effect, uh, uh, despite the futile efforts of the whole world, God has put Jesus as the king over the whole universe. Did you know there was a time when all of the enemies of the world uh, against Jesus, they joined forces with the devil and, do you know, they, they succeeded once. Do you know that time? You know, even when all the enemies against Jesus, they came, G- Judas was there, the Sanhedrin were there, the Jews, Pilate, the Rome, the Romans, the devil, they all came together, they all mounted an assault and they won. They nailed Jesus to a cross. They killed him. They buried him. And God the Father, he laughed. He laughed and he raised Jesus from the dead to the power of an endless life. Glorified him. Lifting him up to sit on his throne forever. And he says, ask of me and I will give you, Jesus, the nations for your inheritance. The ends of the earth for your possession. 
Pilate who? Judas who? It's laughable that we see this even today, don't we? You know, people in our lives, our friends, our family, they resist the kingship of Lord Jesus, don't they, so many times? And it's funny, they speak against him with, with breath that they've borrowed from him, and they, they, they shake their fists at him, fists that he made. And, you know, he, he continues to give them all that they have. He, he provides for them. He protects them. He, he rules over them kindly. He's patient with them when they are against him. He's untouched by all of their strife. And what's even more funny is King Jesus calls these rebels from their sin to faith in him. Jesus calls these rebels to repentance and, and to receive him as their king. And do you know what? They can't resist. He hears their prayers, the prayers of the rebel who, who would come against him and cast his bonds away and dethrone him. He hears their prayers and he saves them. And you know what? They can't stop him. They can't stop him from saving them. What about you? Are you resisting the loving kingship of Jesus? How long has King Jesus been calling, or rather, wooing you? And you've yet to come? You know, you ought to surrender to him. You, ought to, you really ought to surrender. Because God has set him as the king over the whole universe. Yours is to surrender. Yours is to serve. Yours is to run to him. Not into some slavery. Not into servitude. But into his loving, open arms. I have a friend uh, from Cardiff. And... Uh, a few years ago, she was an ardent atheist. She hated God. She hated anything to do with him. Um, and one day, someone from the church shared the gospel with her, and we didn't see her for a very long time. And then out of the blue, she came, she came back. She got in touch with me. She said, I need a Bible. So I didn't ask many questions. I just got her a Bible. And I met up with her, and I said, why, why all of a sudden you want a Bible? What's happened? I thought you hated God. I thought you hated his word. She said, God is calling me by his spirit. And there's nothing I can do. And he's going to win. She knew the game was up. She hadn't even been saved yet. But God was calling her and she knew Jesus is the king. There's nothing I can do. Let's look from verse 7. From verse 7. This is where we begin to look at the, the end of all of this. What is this little section in verses 7 to 9? What is this? Who's speaking here? There's a lot of speech marks around and a couple of different people. What's going on? Well, in verses 7 to 9, we are being made privy to a private conversation between God the Father and God the Son. That is staggering in and of itself. But here's what's happening. Jesus is quoting his father. Jesus says, I will declare the decree that God the Father has said to me. God the Father says to Jesus, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Now this has multiple fulfillments, but we're going to focus on the greatest, which is the second coming of our Saviour. The second coming. This is, uh, is very difficult, in fact it's impossible, to imagine the scale of that day. How fantastic it will be, that event. How enormous. One day you'll be about your business and you'll hear the loudest noise you've ever heard. Jesus will appear. The heavens will unroll like a scroll, and you will forget everything. All you will know is what is happening in front of you. You'll forget your family, you'll forget your name, you'll forget everything. You'll just see Jesus coming on the clouds of glory. 
Everyone will see him. The Father has given him all authority in heaven and earth. The Father has given to Jesus everything. Everything is his. And that day he will come to take it. And you will get to witness that wonderful day. That terrible day. But you won't be alone. You'll look, if you look around, you'll see everyone that you've ever clapped eyes on before. You'll see everyone that you've ever known. Everyone you've ever even heard about. You'll see every prince, every pope, every pauper. Everyone you walked past on the way to church this evening. You'll see everyone that you drive past on the way home. You'll see them again on that last day. Everyone will see him. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess, finally, that Jesus is Lord. This is the inevitable end. Inevitable because God has made his son king over all things. He is already the king. There is no one from whom Jesus is not owed, uh, to whom, from whom Jesus is not owed and requiring an oath of allegiance. Jesus can have that from anyone. So there are some words now for a believer and for an unbeliever, but both are relevant to everyone. Believer, you belong to Jesus. You belong to King Jesus. You are his. And when he comes, you will see him with your own eyes. And when you see him, you'll be made like him. For you will see him as he is. In this life, you have said, for me, to live is Christ. And because of that, death will be your gain. You will see him and he will see you. And he will come to you. This loving king that you have known all your life. He will take you in his arms and he'll take you home. You'll no longer long to love him more. Because you will love him with a heart full of love. There will be no more sin. You will just love him. And he will love you. Unbeliever. You belong to Jesus too. You are already his property. Life, therefore, is just a pointless struggle against his kingship, against his dominion. It's a pointless struggle because God has already made him king. It is a pointless struggle for as long as you refuse his gift of repentance. As long as you refuse his gift, believe the gospel, receive the forgiveness of your sins, receive everlasting life. Your life is a pointless struggle until you receive that gift from him. And so David has some sensible, logical advice in, in verses 10 to 12. Be wise, O kings. Be instructed, judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the Son. Kiss the Son. Be reconciled to God in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the King. He is the King. Kiss Him. Submit to Him now. Enter into a loving relationship of peace with God. I sometimes have a privilege of preaching to a group of um, elderly folk in an old people's home in Dinas Powys. The average age of that congregation is 90. And uh, last time I was there, I was due to speak in a Christian union the following Thursday. And so I asked the elderly folks in this uh, old people's home, I asked them, what shall I say when I speak in the Christian Union to a group of people whose average age is probably 19. They said, tell them that we are 90 odd years old, we've been following Jesus all our lives, and none of us have ever regretted it. That's powerful. How many people 
can say that they don't regret it. They don't regret anything about something. You know, these people, they're in their 90s. They've followed him all their lives. There are many grey hairs, even in this room, who will say, I've never regretted it. I've never regretted following Jesus. I've never regretted bowing the knee, saying, he is my Lord, he is my King. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, to finally complete the work he has started in me. Kiss the Son. Be reconciled to God in Jesus. Throw yourself upon his cross. Because against Jesus, you cannot win. And with Jesus, you cannot lose. I'm going to read a few verses from Revelation and then we'll pray and sing our last song. Revelation 5 says these wonderful words and uh, it's our anticipation to hear them ourselves one day. I looked, I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. The number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. Every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them I heard saying, Blessing and honour and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the kingship of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bless you for the security and for the peace and the confidence that it is to know that he is already king over all the earth. He always has been. We praise you, Lord God, that we can't even begin to imagine what it's like to see him where he is, sitting on the most powerful throne that could ever be. We thank you, Lord, that even now he is in the midst of the throne, a lamb as one slain. We bless you, Lord, that though he was king, though he is equal with God, he still came anyway, and he still surrendered himself to the cross, and the king of the world gave his life to save the world. We pray, Father, that you would forgive us for resisting him so frequently and so often. Forgive us, Lord, for not obeying him like we ought, for not being thankful enough, for being so privileged to be included in his kingdom. We pray, Lord, that you should fill our hearts with a love for him and for his kingdom. We pray that you should fill our minds with an anticipation of his coming, that you should give us a thirst and a desire to see saved those of our friends and our family who have yet to bow the knee. Lord, we pray that you should keep our hearts you should keep our souls until that day when we are called to willingly and gladly get on our knees and worship him forever and forever, to call him our king in death as we have in life. Amen.